So this is the final lecture. And there are several um, items that I want to cover uh, with this last lecture. So we're going to cover something that really nobody else touched upon so far. And that is the fact that there is a biological clock that determines our overall bodily age as well as our brain age. And we're gonna talk about that and talk about how it, it can, could potentially be reprogrammed. Um, also with this talk, I'm going to kind of summarize a lot of the material so that people have an integrated sense of what we've covered with this brain summit. So my affiliations and conflicts of interest haven't changed since my last lecture. Here are my disclosures, my disclaimer. And I know I've gone over this story several times, but you know, you've heard from a lot of different speakers. Um, each speaker is sort of like one of these uh, blind men that comes across an elephant. They're each feeling one particular part of the element. And you know, truth is when we incorporate all these different concepts of what an elephant is. And we're gonna take the elephant in this case is aging related degeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other conditions. And we're gonna to try to in incorporate all these different ideas that you've heard during this brain summit in, in the present lecture. So some of the goals include the following regarding the Grim Reaper clock. So that's a clock that has to do with the um, control of your age. So the aging of the body and the brain is not just the result of the exposures that you have in, you, in your life and the damage that results from that, the so-called exposome. It turns out that many milestones of life appear according to a time schedule. The presence of a grim reaper clock may have, interestingly, survival qualities for the species, obviously not for the individual. There appears to be a biological clock that involves the hypothalamus and pineal, and the biological clock may be reset in a manner that changes the aging process. So just a couple of definitions before we cast off on our venture. So germ cell progenitors, those are the cells that form the reproductive cells, the gametes. That's an egg cell in a woman and a sperm cell in a man. A stem cell is a cell that's capable of either copying itself or differentiating into a somatic cell that's more specialized. And a somatic cell is a cell that's differentiated to perform certain specialized functions. For example, a neuron is a somatic cell that engages in networking required for cognition. And microglia, we've, we've covered that before, is a brain resident somatic cell that is both a creator and a destroyer. I wanted to talk a little bit about exosomes. So exosomes are little packets, little packets of instructions that are created um, by virtually every cell in the body. However, what that does is it lets one cell communicate with another in such a way that there may be a change in the behavior of the receiving cell. And you can think of an exosome as almost being like a UPS package. So it'll have an address of origination and it will typically have an address where it should be delivered to and if you open up the package, there's a series of instructions that tells the receiver what's going on at the site of origination and also what might be a, a recommended change in behavior of the recipient. A story about the biological clock starts in a remote island, which is St. Matthew's Island in the Bering Sea. It's a very remote place, but it was the location for an important experiment in nature. The experiment was as follows. During World War II, the US Navy thought it would be a good idea to station some troops there to have a remote outposts section um, where they placed a radar um, receiver. Now they thought it would be also a great idea to bring reindeer onto the island. Now it turns out that this island is fairly remote, 
but I guess there's enough grass and lichens and other things for reindeer to eat. Unfortunately, there are no natural predators for the reindeer. So after the men left at the end of World War II, the reindeer were left behind. So what happened to these reindeer? Well, many years later, when people visited this remote island, they found out that the reindeer population exploded. So rather than just having perhaps a few hundred reindeer, there were several thousand. I think it was estimated up to 6,000 reindeer were living on this small island. Some years later, people came back to revisit the island. And what did they find? All the reindeer were dead. So what happened? So what happened in this experiment of nature? It turned out that without natural predators, these reindeer lived so long and procreated so fast that their population overran the ecosystem. They basically exhausted all the resources they needed to survive and everybody died. So it brought up the in interesting question. Well, perhaps it's a good thing for there to be programmed death for the individual because otherwise, as one continues to procreate, it's possible that a species could overrun the ecosystem, exhaust all the, all the supplies, and lead to a demise of the species. So in order for the species to survive, perhaps a lifetime needs to be limited. So think about this. Why do rapidly proliferating species have relatively short lifespans? Interesting. How about mice and rats and rabbits for that matter? Well, they proliferate very rapidly and yet they have extremely short lifespans. So mice and rats live only two or three years and they age very quickly. So the aging process, maybe that's a preparation to end their life. Think of that as a possibility. On the other hand, slowly proliferating species have relatively long lifespans. So for example, humans projected to live 80 something years, plus or minus. Elephants live fairly long lives. Tortoises live fairly long lives. Importantly, it's not related to size of the animal. So you think, well, mice and rats, there's something about their metabolic rate or something along those lines. And just a matter of size is why they live a short time. But in fact, a termite queen, you know, just a matter of a centimeter or two in size, um, they live 40 years. They have a relatively long life. Then you start looking at milestones in the average person's life. So if you look at the onset of puberty, it seems to come at a relatively typically scheduled time. So 10 years plus or minus. Another milestone, menopause. It seems to occur more or less according to a schedule. So 50 years plus or minus. Are we getting the idea so far? So death seems to occur around 75, 80 years, plus or minus. And interestingly, the onset of dementia is somewhere around that 70 to 80 year time frame. And maybe with regards to the present discussion, immune function seems to be regulated according to a very specific schedule. So your immune system peaks at around age 20. And by the time you're age 40, 50 or so, your immune system is quite deficient. And that's exactly when problems start to occur with degenerative diseases and cancers. So the immune system is no longer to, able to keep some of these other issues in check. I would also point out to keep Dr. Goodenow happy 
that paroxysmal, paroxys, par, paroxysome and mitochondrial failure also parallels the lifetime profile of immune function. So by the time you get into your 30s, 40s, and 50s, there, there starts to be a drop-off in the function of peroxisomes and mitochondria. So what's going on here? Very interesting paper. I recommend that everyone read this. It's by Dr. Kai's group, CAI, at the Einstein, um, at Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine. This came out in Nature in 2017. A very interesting experiment that gives us a glimpse into the possibility that there is a biological clock that actually determines some of these various scheduled or apparently scheduled milestones in life. And he did the following experiment. If you put a micropipette and you put it uh, into the brain of a mouse and you put it adjacent to the uh, third ventricle adjacent to the hypothalamus. And specifically, we're interested in the lining cells around the hypothalamus, which are essentially stem cells so that they can proliferate and differentiate, but they also give off exosomes. Remember these packets of information. If you do some very interesting immunological things to the um, hypothalamic lining cells, so you can basically kill them off selectively, but not damaging the rest of the hypothalamus. You can take a relatively young mouse and immediately make him old. So the hair falls out, their muscles get weak, their bones become osteoporotic. They're not sexually active anymore. They can't run mazes and learn new tricks. So they become old very quickly. But then you can do the following experiment. You can take these exosomes derived from a healthy young stem cell from the hypothalamus. So these very same stem cells that are they're killed off in this experiment. So again, you take another mouse, you kill off the stem cells, but you replace it now with an infusion of just the exosomes that have an instruction set, look what happens. The mouse remains young. They're sexually active. They can learn new tricks. They're strong. Their bones are good. Their hair is thick. They're basically young and they live a long time. So it appears that the lining cells of the hypothalamus have youth signals, youth signals that determines the age of the organism and the age of the brain. So what happens in aging to a mouse that doesn't have these stem cells destroyed by Dr. Kai's group? Well, perhaps they proliferate and because of the number of proliferation steps, they are no longer youthful and they can't proliferate anymore so that there's an exhaustion of available stem cells to create these exosomes. So you might consider this something along the lines of what Hayflick was talking about. So there might be a Hayflick number for the stem cells in the hypothalamus. Or, is there something more along the lines of what Dr. Horvath is talking about? Is there some epigenetic change in the instruction set within the nuclei of these stem cells that makes them change what they create in terms of exosomal delivery? In either case, the clock, like many other known clocks, is influenced by outside factors. So it may be programmable. So if you superimpose some toxic effect, if you, if you superimpose an infection, if you superimpose some other kind of influence like radiation, you can perhaps kill off these stem cells and accelerate the aging process. So it is, it is influenced. And maybe there are some things that we can do to selectively influence these lining cells in the hypothalamus and maintain young age. 
So these particular cells live in the hypothalamus, in the, in the lining here. And what's very interesting to me is as these exosomes are created and they communicate with other structures, there's a very short, I wanna say stone's throw, but a very short exosome throw from the lining cells in the hypothalamus to the pineal. Now, why am I interested in the pineal gland? Well, it turns out that the pineal gland has an intimate relationship with the thymus gland. And it's the thymus gland that's responsible for our immune sufficiency. And when the thymus gland degenerates rapidly in youth, that is one reason why the immune system will peak in let's say your 20s and then falls off by your 40s. And that leads to the possibility of infections getting into the brain and activating there, um, changing the biome in the gut and causing those indirect effects that everybody has been talking about. So it turns out that the main item that is produced by the pineal is melatonin. And if you look at melatonin production, it dramatically falls off with age. And in fact, the pineal is known to calcify at a very early age. Now, one thing you can do is you can take a pineal, you can take um, an animal that's had their pineal uh, gland removed and you can just um, graft the pineal gland somewhere else and you can sustain a relatively long life of, uh, of a mouse. But if you, if you cut out the, um, the pineal gland, the mouse dies and ages very quickly. And there are a number of researchers that have looked at this phenomenon, but basically if one does a pinealectomy at an early age, it produces rapid uh, illness, rapid aging and very early death. So how about these natural experiments that happen in children who have cardiac surgery? Well, the natural experiment here is that to get access to the heart in a neonate, the thymus is so large that they often have to do a thymectomy to get access to the heart in order to perform the surgery. So what happens to these kids? Well, this is done after the neonatal age. So these are when children are, uh, toddlers typically. And it, you know, it seems that they do fairly well because there's enough um, T cells that escape the thymus um, that they, they'd appear to um, avoid most of the childhood infections that occur with other individuals that have uh, the George syndrome where there's a dysplasia of the uh, thymus at the time of birth. But this is becoming an increasingly scrutinized problem because now as these children have grown into older age, it does appear that they have an early senescence of their immune system. And it, it looks like um, there may be problems with early aging. So um, various people are thinking about uh, ways of trying to regenerate the thymus. For example, taking some uh, resident um, thymic cells um, in an older individual and transfecting them with exosomes from young individuals and see if we can do um, the same experiment that Kai did with the hypothalamus, see that if you can do that with thymic remnants and then give it back to an individual. So melatonin is the main product of, of the pineal gland. So what if we just give melatonin um, to an elderly person. Well, it's, it turns out to be difficult to give high doses of melatonin. And um, already the thymic tissue has degenerated. So one wouldn't expect big changes if you start giving melatonin in an, an adult that's already had thymic involution. However, there are a, a number of studies that have looked at melatonin supplementation in healthy adults and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And there actually is a small effect. So, you know, just like um, perhaps the effect of um, uh, Aduhelm, um, it's a very small effect. Here's another thing that you might add to the mix 
uh, in terms of uh, perhaps a, a multi-pronged approach to treating uh, individuals with a degenerative process. So what's the consequence of this programmed loss of immune sus sus the system? Well, the, microme, the microbiome um, is no longer under control. So if we're talking about those dormant um, bacteria that live in the brain normally, and we look at the mix of bacteria in the gut, um, which are normally, which there may be a normal mixture originally, but as you lose the immune competence, you start getting um, pathological species in the gut, you get a loss of this dormancy state in the brain and um, all heck breaks out. So we have these effects of infection, direct effects due to emergence from dormancy and indirect effects due to inflammation and proteinopathy. So then you ask the question, well, why do people get certain clinical syndromes like Alzheimer's disease? It's typically memory loss, problems with word finding in the beginning. Folks with Parkinson's disease, it tends to be a motor problem early on. So it turns out that these different tissues have vulnerabilities to different aging related conditions. And let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, it's the nucleus basalis of Maynard that houses the cholinergic nuclei that actually innervate the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, those areas that are relevant um, for memory. And it's this part of the brain that is uh, going to be targeted with uh, Dr. Goodenow's um, ethanolamine plasmologen. So uh, we need to support uh, this particular cell group, um, which provides cho cholinergic innervation to uh, virtually the entire brain, but particularly the hippocampus. So it turns out that through the cribriform plate at the top of the nose, um, there are various portals of entry uh, into the brain through the um, olfactory nerves and through the trigeminal uh, branches that can end up uh, bringing uh, toxic substances and perhaps bacterial and microbial uh, issues uh, to uh, this part of the brain. So um, with the trigeminal um, branches at the top of the nose, um, that does go to the brain stem, which is also a problem with Alzheimer's disease. They do have early problems with the locus ceruleus, for example, um, but also the uh, trigeminal actually innervates um, those uh, blood vessels that form the uh, circle of Willis at the base of the brain. And that comes very close to where the nucleus basalis is. We talked about um, porphyromonas and uh, uh, various other kinds of bacteria that live in the gums. Um, they can get uh, to the brain, uh, not only through trigeminal branches, but potentially through the venous system. So imagine you're sitting in the dental chair or you have gum disease and you're lying down with your, uh, your head back and there's a tendency for the flow to actually go retrograde um, back into the uh, venous plexus, the skull base. And that's exactly where the nucleus basalis lives. So there are other vulnerabilities that have to do with the fact that um, the human brain has expanded so much as a result of evolution that some of these small nuclear groups have to do an enormous amount of work to do their job, to do their job correctly. So the, the uh, substantia nigra has to branch extensively to take care of the entire basal ganglia, which has expanded tremendously uh, over the course of evolution. So there's very little margin of safety in these, uh, in these neurons. And there's only a very small number of them, very similar to what happens with the locus ceruleus, which happens to ha play a very important role in that neurovascular coupling that Dr. Kuhn was talking about. And that's lost in both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. But a similar problem happens with the substantia nigra that's responsible for the movement disorder that's clinically evident. There's also a, um, the fact that um, there's a biochemical vulnerability of, a, of the uh, substantia nigra because they have this dopamine transporter that can take some of these toxins that we're worried about and can actually selectively pump them into the um, uh, nerve cell uh, and cause damage from that standpoint. We've talked a little bit about um, 
that gut brain connection, well, there are indirect effects, but then there are also direct effects through the vagus. And we, we spoke about those patients who had vagotomy early in life, they don't tend to get pal, uh, Parkinson's disease because that connection through the vagus is no longer there. So let's talk about these stem cells and let's talk about what we can do to try to support them. Is there some pathway that we can do to try to build them back up in humans? Well, first of all, stem cells exist even in adults in um, really three different areas. So one is lining the ventricles adjacent to the basal ganglia. So it's my fantasy that the basal, glang ba basal ganglia is responsible for overlearned skills. For example, how to dance, how to drive the car. So maybe how to do a trick. Um, but in this old expression, old dogs don't learn new tricks. And that's probable because there's an exhaustion of the stem cells that are necessary to form new connections in the basal ganglia. But new memories depend on the stem cells adjacent to the hippocampus. So there's this um, subgranular zone that's adjacent to the hippocampal formation that's responsible for uh, making new memories in the hippocampus. And then we're, we also wanna talk about these stem cells that line the hypothalamus that we just spoke about with regards to mice, but they also exist in humans. And there've been some interesting experiments that have been done with these stem cells in the hippocampal formation. And um, uh, this is another uh, landmark paper, which I recommend that everybody reads by Vieta and et al, Nature 2011. And these are some famous experiments that, are, that were done with parabiosis. So here you can take two mice and you can tie their circulations together. So that way they mix all their blood products. So the blood cells as well as the plasma is intermixed. We can do that with young mice, same age. <clears throat> we can do that with old mice, again, the same age. So we call those heterochronic. So chronic, I guess, is the Greek root for time. So they're the same age, but you can also take individuals of different ages. So you can take a young mouse, tie him with an old mouse and vice versa. Let's see what happens to the stem cells in the hippocampus when you do these experiments. If you take a young mouse and tie it together with another young mouse, you see basically a normal arrangement of stem cells. So this is what a healthy young stem cell population would look like. Imagine that this is very similar what we all wish we have in our hippocampal formations as humans. Then you can do this with uh, a, uh, an old uh, mouse connected to another old mouse. And what you can see here is there's very few stem cells left. There are some, it's not completely exhausted, but there's very few. Compare young, young to young, old to old. Well, we'd all like to do this experiment. And this is sort of the experiment that people do um, in practice nowadays. And you hear this in experiments where stem cells are given, which give off exosomes or exosomes are given. And actually not a lot happens clinically. It's very disappointing. And we're gonna learn a little bit more why in just a moment. But nevertheless, if you tie an old mouse and look at his brain uh, wh where they've been exposed to a young mouse, you start to see at least a few stem cells come back. Not very dramatic, but there's some, there's some growth. But here's the thing that's really interesting in my mind and something which must be a take home message to everybody in this conference. If you look at a normal young mouse and now you tie that young mouse to an old mouse, you actually get death. So there are toxic substances 
that kill off the stem cells. And it turns out that this does not require cells. This is something that happens with plasma transfer. So if you take a young mouse and you give him young plasma, the stem cells look fine. However, if you take a young mouse and you give them old plasma, things start to die. So they're toxic substances in plasma. Now this could be soluble substances and there probably are many. And this also includes exosomes. So old exosomes have a toxic instruction set. It tells the cells, it's time for you to go. Now exosomes, let's look at them a little bit more. Exosomes are created by just about every cell in the body, but we're particularly interested about these exosomes in the hypothalamic lining because they seem to make a big difference in whether or not, whether or not those mice in the experiment we talk about get old or whether you can reverse them by giving them young exosomes. They're very tiny, 30 to 100 nanometers. Might be interesting to see how they're created. There's an invagination of the plasma membrane. There's another invagination step. So this is a double invagination step in these microbodies, micro, and, and these are now packed with the instruction set in a very selective way, it's not random. So as they're released, they have an instruction set, which is meaningful for that stage of the animal's lifetime. So we can look at them, we can characterize them. They have certain ligon, light ligands, which tells them exactly where they're gonna to connect to when they float around in the bloodstream. So let's start looking at the possibility of giving stem cells, which after all, stem cells pretty much die off and they give off exosomes before they die off. And that's how they give off most of their beneficial effect clinically. So a landmark article that was done by the Stanford group, Dr. Steinberg, where they took um, uh, genetically engineered stem cells, inject them in the brain, and they could show even two years after a stroke that you could actually get some return of function. So we don't really wanna do this surgically like was done with the Steinberg group uh, or with Kai's group with mice. We'd like to find some way of delivering exosomes with the young program set to the brain in some way that makes sense. We don't wanna do it by direct injection. Um, we can give it intravenously. However, it's gonna go all over the place and maybe not where we want it to go in this hypothalamic region. We can try mannitol, which will temporarily open up the blood brain barrier. But again, that's very nonspecific and somewhat toxic. So how about uh, giving this in a nasal fashion? And people have been very interested in um, nasal delivery of uh, various things. <clears throat> the problem here is unlike that young mouse, um, where the, the um, pathways through the nose are fairly uh, patent and unlike young humans where it's relatively patent. As you get older, the cribriform plate actually calcifies. So the pathway from the nose to the brain is not quite as robust as you would like. Um, furthermore, if it does get taken up by the olfactory, now remember these folks have loss of olfaction by the time they have Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So the olfactory pathways are not likely to be intact. Furthermore, there is calcification of the cribriform plate, so it makes it very difficult to get things through the olfactory system. You might still get some things into the trigeminal pathway, but that actually delivers things to the brainstem and not to the nucleus basalis of Maynard that you're interested in. So it's not a selective delivery system. Now, it is a convenient way of giving it intravenously, if you will, um, because there's um, abundant um, vascular supply to the nose that can take up these particles. So we can do things that are sort of minimally invasive, but still invasive nevertheless, is that we can inject um, exosomes and stem cells directly into the spinal fluid. And for some years, um, uh, people were doing this, including myself, but it is somewhat invasive and it is kind of scary uh, to be injecting uh, around the, uh, the brainstem with a needle. So, 
the concept is, can we be more selective in delivering these exosomes in a way that makes sense so that we can do this uh, inexpensively, safely in humans? So there are a couple of uh, preconditioning techniques that can actually increase blood flow and potentially open up the blood brain barrier in such a way where an intravenous delivery system might actually target things in a more selective way. Um, there are technologies such as shockwave. We wouldn't want to use this in the brain because it could be damaging. Focused ultrasound is something that I'm going to talk about at length, but other therapies might also be considered light therapy, magnetic therapy. And just remember that these exosomes have ligands. So the ligands can also be developed in such a way that they stick to specific targets, like for example, let's say the hypothalamus. But for now, focused ultrasound is something that we've worked extensively with. And focused ultrasound is basically sound waves, um, which is focused with an acoustic lens. And it's, um, it can be given across the intact skull. It's uh, painless and, um, and it's uh, harmless, in fact, uh, if you stay within certain parameters. Now we, we've been able to, uh, we've, we've published some material already using focused ultrasound for delivering small molecules. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we we're able to show that almost 50% of the individuals improved by almost an entire cognitive dementia level. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the degree of um, improvement was in the uh, studies that were quoted by uh, Dr. Bredesen um, some moments ago, but here we're talking about big changes. So a, a CDR level is like going from moderate dementia to mild dementia or mild dementia to not demented. These are big changes. And that happened almost half the time just using focused ultrasound in concert with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So the tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, increase autophagy and they also have inflammatory effects, but they don't get across the brain, blood brain barrier very well. So this is a way of trying to deliver them more specifically. And we're able to demonstrate in humans that we can actually improve delivery by using focused ultrasound. So here we're looking at an individual with Alzheimer's disease. And if you look at their arterial spin labeling in, in, uh, at rest, so here we're looking at blood flow at rest. And there's very little blood flow going to this hippocampus. After um, just 10 minutes of focused ultrasound, we're able to increase selectively because we were looking at, we were actually targeting the hippocampus in this individual. We were able to show that we could increase the blood flow eight times the baseline. So that means eight times the blood flow went selectively to the target we're interested, which is the hippocampus. So we could deliver more small molecules or particulates or whatever you want to deliver it's gonna be eight times more likely to be delivered there because of increased blood flow. So if you give something intravenously, more of it's gonna go specifically to the target you're interested in. Now we've looked at animal, so we have an animal lab in, that we do in, in concert with uh, City of Hope and um, a call out to Karen Abudi and her team. We were able to show in, um, in rats that if you look at, um, the blood brain barrier um, in, uh, in just a normal brain untreated. So this is the hippocampal formation in an untreated rat. But then you give the focused ultrasound and you can start to see, if you look at this high power, you can start to see that there are changes in the endothelium. You're starting to get some leakage across the blood brain barrier into brain tissue. So once these, um, uh, once these particles uh, can get across the endothelium and they stick to the endothelium better, then we know that, that you don't even need to open up the, the junctions between the, the endothelium, um, that a lot of them will actually get across by transcytosis. So you don't have to actually do anything that's destructive, like opening up the blood-brain barrier. And here's a group that's um, affiliated with NIH, which, where they actually uh, stain the exosomes and you can see these little dots are actually exosomes in brain tissue after focused ultrasound in, our, in a rodent model. So it looks like we can deliver exosomes. And if Dr. Kai's group is correct, 
we can make older animal, animals younger again by giving them young exosomes. How do we do that? And how do we do that efficiency, efficiently? So it, it makes sense to me that to do this efficiently, we have to take care of the inflammatory processes and the toxic elements that are going on in that same individual. It makes no sense to deliver exosomes if there's toxic effects there. We showed you with that Vieta et al. study that if there are toxic elements, it's gonna kill off the exosomes, it's gonna kill off the stem cells, you have an uphill battle. So we wanna remove those toxic elements first before we give the exosomes. Remember the, we wanna do this at an early stage of involvement. So we wanna take those individuals coming in with minor memory loss and do some of these advanced imaging techniques that, um, that are in the pipeline now that um, Dr. Kuhn was talking about. Um, arterial spin labeling, DTI, these are um, FDA approved for using in humans. We can use them at an early stage and get some handle on whether this uh, early cognitive change is really something that needs attention. Remember that these uh, spirochetes are living in their, our brains. They're, the um, toxins are coming out of the uh, porphyromonas in our mouth. We have indirect effects coming from the gut. Various, we have leakiness of the blood-brain barrier because we don't have the right constituents in the gut that keep those leaks sealed. We have the proteinopathy that's occurring. We have the loss of the neurovascular coupling. We have to throw in the fact that we need to be wary about the, lip, the lipid profile that may be abnormal because our uh, peroxisomes are not making the right um, plasmalogens anymore. And so what we should be thinking is getting rid of these toxic influences before we give the exosome. So I think the sequence of treatment is important. So um, there is a study using plasmapheresis. So this is a nice, nice way um, of getting rid of various toxins that may be floating around the system. And I go back to that um, Vieta uh, et al. study in Nature 2011, where they showed that even the plasma is toxic. So perhaps what we should be doing is filtering out the plasma in these individuals before we go any steps further. And actually, if you just simply plasma -phorese individuals with Alzheimer's disease, you can show some improvements. And this is Boada 2020. I encourage everybody to read this article about the application of plasma -phoresis to get rid of toxins in elderly individuals. So think of it, those mycotoxins, um, those uh, small molecule elements that may be toxic, the toxic exosomes, all of those could be potentially removed by plasmapheresis. So here's summarizing just about the entire weekend. So what should be our treatment strategy in sequential order? First of all, we should be evaluating for chronic infections that have that worsen immunosenescence such as CMV. We wanna look at the nasal, oral, and gastrointestinal biome, check them and see what we can do to help with our diet, with probiotics, prebiotics, and perhaps antibiotics. What can we do with antibiotics, both bacterial, fungal, and viral, for those uh, individuals that are identified to have particular problem species that might be causing trouble? In the pipeline would be uh, antitoxin measures for Gigi pains. These are not yet available. So these are the toxins created by those mouth organisms. Um, many of the individuals at today's um, summit will be uh, familiar with uh, myco mycotoxins and what can be done uh, to try to bind them with um, uh, bile uh, binding agents and other agents. So we have to be considering our dental health. Um, I'm very interested in this blue light therapy that can also be um, uh, a way of uh, potentially killing off some of these pathogens in the mouth. So uh, nutritional supplementation, diet, fasting, probiotics for the nose, mouth, and gut, and, and as a last resort, fecal transplantation, all things that need to be considered at an early stage, not at the stage where we're giving them stem cells or exosomes. Exercise, mobility, these are all things that we should be supporting. 
Think about medications potentially for immune support. Think about plasmapheresis and autophagy support at an early stage. Get rid of some of these toxic influences. And then as a last item, the la very last thing in our list is stem cells and exosomes, and what can we do to deliver them in a targeted fashion? So, so to summarize a mountain of data that was presented to you over this weekend, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease are multifactorial in causation with immunosenescence likely producing both direct and inner indirect effects from microbial growth and other sources of inflammation. Programmed senescence may also be a factor. Think of the Grim Reaper clock. So inflammation, infection, and programmed senescence is likely to damage both somatic cells and those natural stem cells that are needed to maintain youth. Effective treatment will likely require both neutralization of toxic and damaging effects of immunosenescence, as well as targeted delivery of regenerative factors such as stem cells and exosomes. If people are interested in reading more about an integrated approach, um, here is my book, um, Regenesis, The Brain Doctor's Guide to Health. Uh, you can go to my uh, practice website and it's also available as uh, an uh, Amazon uh, Kindle store item. So having said that, um, I bring this summit to a close and we can certainly open the floor for questions. All right, it looks like we have uh, four of them in the, uh, in the Q and A. Okay, do you want me to, I can read them and okay. answer them. Sure, okay. <clears throat> so some people think that drinking coffee is useful. They become more alert and they're able to focus. The memories are sharper. Um, what part of the brain causes this scenario? Well, um, uh, caffeine, uh, I believe, um, uh, acts uh, um, at a particular neurotransmitter that's responsible for alertness. Um, it's uh, adenosine, um, uh, appears to be important in the uh, sleep-wake cycle, and uh, uh, caffeine actually interacts with that neurotransmitter. Um, th there, there's also some evidence that um, some uh, modest uh, exposure to coffee, and by the way, modest exposure to alcohol may also have some long-term uh, beneficial effects uh, when we look at the incidence of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So the next one, in Italy, there's a pharmaceutical company which commercializes a particular compound made of hypothalamic phospholipids together with mannitol in a parenteral uh, formulation. Well, um, I, I'm not sure what to do with that question. Um, I'd have to look into this item. I don't really know much about this. Um, I think phospholipids um, in a general sense um, uh, would be something that includes uh, agents such as lecithin, which probably has some modest uh, beneficial effects. Uh, people take this orally and they take it uh, intravenously. Um, I'm using APC um, and Serifos to go along with um, the um, ethanolamine plasmologen precursor. Um, that's the way I'm uh, meeting this need. Um, I'd have to look at these uh, phospholipids to see how they fit in, um, but I don't really know anything about them. So low-dose immunotherapy, what is your opinion about it? Um, I'd have to understand what this is uh, really all about. Um, uh, so if you think of um, using rapamycin, for example, so this is an immunotherapy, and um, I, I think that this is what that question is related to. Um, so there, there is some excitement about using immunotherapy agents um, uh, such as um, rapamycin. Um, uh, people are doing it in pulses, people are doing it in low dose. It seems to be fairly well tolerated if you uh, don't use the doses that are used for like uh, real clinical immunosuppressant for transplant situations. Um, this is interesting. Um, I haven't used it yet because I have a, just uh, so many things I can do with my patients, uh, including some of the th things that we uh, presented at these lectures. Um, but I think it's definitely something that uh, can be looked into. Um, rapamycin in particular, 
um, is not just working as an uh, immunotherapy agent in this regards. It also uh, seems to turn on the autophagy uh, process. Uh, many of these agents have multiple uh, targets in the cell. Um, so this is something to, to, to look for. I certainly would not recommend something that's strongly immunosuppressant in nature because I think the very nature of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease is that there's uh, immunosenescence. Uh, there's immunodeficiency, uh, which allows uh, resident uh, bugs uh, uh, to uh, come out of their dormant state in the brain, and it changes the biome in the gut, which has its indirect effects. So I, I certainly would not be a proponent of any strong immunosuppressant. Uh, what about senolytics? Yes, uh, well, fisetin is something that I've used. Um, I think it's something to definitely consider. Um, um, I, I think what I need to do uh, for everybody's sake is sort of uh, uh, give you a list of my, uh, my high ticket items um, that I would propose to patients. There are supplements that I like to think to really um, uh, give to almost everybody. But ju just remember when you get to be um, beyond five or 10 supplements and medications, uh, it becomes a problem for these individuals that are already um, having cognitive issues and um, where the caretakers are uh, stressed out. Um, so uh, I think it's important to really try to pare down the list of supplements that we give them. Um, um, I, I would say, um, the ones that I give the highest priority to would be um, the uh, plasmologen precursor, um, some sort of uh, uh, phospholipid uh, replacement. Um, I'm using AP, uh, AP, APC. You could use um, um, uh, lecithin. Um, I like use serifos because me, that gives me the ethanolamine uh, component. I use activated B vitamins for all those things that are necessary. I like to use NAC. Uh, you can also use various kinds of glutathione um, supplements. Uh, you can use NAD supplements as well. Um, I think um, estradiol, um, because of its um, um, sole effect in um, um, uh, telomerase uh, activation is, is an interesting thing to consider. Um, and I, I think having a uh, Fisotin or some other uh, senolytic uh, seems to make sense. So um, uh, vitamin D, if they're vitamin D deficient, uh, coenzyme Q10, um, you see very, very rapidly, we're getting to that uh, 10 limit that I'd like to keep this to. So um, that's sort of my hit parade of, um, of items that I've considering just about everybody. Um, some studies on cannabinoid effects on amyloid in neuroinflammation. Um, this is an emerging field. I don't know a lot about this. Um, so remember where I am, where my neck of the woods is, uh, California, Los Angeles. Uh, just about everybody comes in on cannabinoids. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how effective they are. They definitely uh, can be used to help sleep and anxiety. Um, so um, uh, if patients are, are anxious and they're not sleeping, uh, I certainly would consider cannabinoids. Um, I'd like to learn more about what they have to do with amyloid and neuroinflammation. Um, there's some evidence that they do have some effect. Um, but again, a lot of my patients are already on it. So I don't really have much to add for my patients. Are there any FDA re regulations, restrictions placed on exosomes? Thank you so much for bringing that up. Exosomes cannot be given outside of a clinical trial that has FDA uh, licensing. Um, uh, the, the exosomes were, and also for that matter, stem cells um, were, were sort of in a, in, a, in a gray zone some years ago. The FDA has been uh, very forthcoming in, um, in sending out guidelines and warnings to both patients and providers. Um, I do not give exosomes. I do not give stem cells uh, unless it's part of a clinical trial. Um, so uh, I would not recommend that it's given outside of a clinical trial. Um, I'm trying to work with the FDA uh, to use focus ultrasound with exosomes. We have several exosome species that we're working with um, in concert with City of Hope. And um, uh, we plan to uh, study this in humans. This is something that we're already doing. Um, but it should not be given outside of a clinical trial in, 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 my, um, uh, in my estimation. I don't recommend that. Uh, looking at depression as a risk factor for Alzheimer's, are there any additional supplements you would recommend in that population be, beyond what you've already uh, listed? Um, well, uh, people are often taking 5-HTP uh, um, as another supplement. 
um, if, if you want to go with something that's a nutraceutical, um, I think that makes sense. But you know, remember, there is an important um, uh, inflammatory component with depression. So uh, some of the same um, anti-inflammatory measures, including looking at the gut-brain connection, um, all those factors that we talked about with Alzheimer's disease really relate to depression uh, as well. So um, uh, the one big difference might be, for example, adding uh, 5-HTP if someone doesn't want to take an antidepressant. And also, if they're not interested in medication, and there are a lot of reasons why they might not be interested in medications. So um, we've had a lot of experience with um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, uh, that's a very good um, application for individuals that don't want to take medications or have had complications with medications. Um, and that can be used for people who are depressed, including those who are depressed and have Alzheimer's disease. Um, so uh, also focused ultrasound, we've had some um, benefit in treating um, anxiety. That's in a clinical protocol. We, you can actually use focused ultrasound as a standalone treatment for the amygdala. So the amygdala being a seat of emotional disturbance, um, that, can be, uh, that can be reached with focused ultrasound as a standalone treatment. So um, there are things that are in clinical trials that people can be um, um, made available to. Um, so um, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, how do I obtain? Uh, uh, so um, the, um, there, there are multiple brands of um, uh, alpha GPC, that's GPC. Can I say APC? That's uh, Alpha GPC. Um, there are multiple brands out there. Um, this is for, um, I, I'm not really sure the brand is that I use, um, but um, uh, there are some services that um, I refer patients to, including uh, full scripts. Um, Prodrome Sciences has a website where you can get these items um, and, on Amazon. Uh, and actually your, your neighborhood uh, health food store will often have um, uh, items that have, uh, you know, alpha GPC. Um, and do you have any thoughts about low laser uh, therapy for mitochondrial dysfunction? Yes. So um, we're using um, a, uh, a laser treatment that can actually penetrate seven centimeters and more into the brain. We're using it for post COVID patients. This is a clinical trial. Um, uh, I, I, it, we've, we've had some uh, early uh, benefits that have been demonstrated uh, in these in individuals. We also use it after head trauma where the frontal lobes are, are easy to, um, to get with um, uh, a laser-based um, uh, light therapy. So we're using light therapy at 1064 nanometers. Um, there are uh, con consumer level devices uh, that are LED devices that don't really penetrate very much into the brain. I don't really know how useful they are. Um, I, I think um, Dr. Bredesen was mentioning uh, Violite, which is something that clips onto the nose and you can also uh, use it for the head. Um, it, it's an interesting you know, low-level laser therapy. I don't know how successful uh, that it actually is. Um, I, I am using light therapy for the mouth though. Um, so blue light. Um, and um, uh, there is a device that's made by... Um, uh, DPL that that's a um, that's like sort of a, a bite guard type device with ha which has in, in incorporated LEDs. There you don't have to worry about penetration. You just have to get it uh, into the gums. And um, this is antibacterial, so I, I use it myself. And um, it, it, it's marketed as a tooth whitener, which, if you see my teeth, works really nicely considering that I drink a lot of wine and drink coffee. Um, so it, it, it's marketed as a tooth whitener, but it also probably has some antibacterial effects. Do you have any better effects with, with uh, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy bodies or, patient, or Parkinson's disease? Yeah, well, we've used um, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, in uh, uh, the uh, Parkinson's plus patients, which includes the Lewy body and Parkinson's patients, Parkinson's spectrum, I like to call them. Um, we've used the ty tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so has the Georgetown a group with Dr. Pagan and uh, Musa, and um, uh, they've had some uh, some results with um, with the Parkinson spectrum patients. Here, when I use focused ultrasound to help deliver the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, we're going for the putamen substantia nigra rather than the nucleus basalis of Minert and the hippocampus. So uh, it's a targeted delivery. And again, we we had. Um, um, improvement in cognitive scores and overall functionality uh, in, in a similar uh, 
um, degree than we have with our Alzheimer's patients. So these are also a, tre a treatable group. Um, my understanding is the APOC1 gene is uh, inherited with uh, APOE4 70% of the time and is required for uh, APOE4 to have its effect in Alzheimer's risk. Any thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, I personally don't think the APOE4 um, uh, effect is that, that much to worry about. Um, um, if, if you were um, listening to Dr. Goodnow's lecture, um, once you give people the plasmologen uh, precursor, the APOE4 effect really sort of goes away. Um, so um, I have all my patients on plasmologen uh, precursors. So for, uh, in my mind, this isn't uh, an issue. So I think those are all the questions that people have. Um, and um, uh, I'll just uh, maybe throw the floor out to any of the other uh, panel members and see if they have any other questions for me. And, um, uh, and, and maybe they can grill me on why did I do a better job here? But um, <laughs> hope, hopefully they have a few, few compliments as well. <laughs> One thing that I get from conversations with doctors around the country is they really intrigued with this focused ultrasound technique. And they wanna know when would something like that become available in their practices or protocols or how long will it take before something like that can be more useful? And, and in your mind, how widespread can that become like what are safety implication you know implementation issues that might be present i don't think there's any, any uh much in the way of a safety um a problem in in the protocols that we're uh, using now there there are about six centers around the country that are using focused ultrasound therapy um, we're one of them so uh, the regenesis project that i'm the head of is one of them i believe there's one at uh, brown and yale and stanford and Harvard and UCLA, there are two. Um, uh, there's also one at the University of um, uh, Charleston in South Carolina. So there are a few places that are looking into focused ultrasound uh, treatments. Um, the, the early effects are very interesting from around the country, um, but here we're not just treating uh, degenerative disease, we're interested in treating a variety of neuro and psychiatric conditions, including uh, uh, not just Alzheimer's disease, but um, anxiety and depression and OCD. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've particularly been interested in using this not only for, as a standalone therapy, for, but as a um, means of delivering in an efficient fashion um, stem cells and exosomes, as well as small molecules. So right now it's not widely available um, if you have some particular individuals that are interested in getting access to this therapy, just call my office. Um, the, um, you know, what I'll, what I'll do to individuals is um, myself and my staff will have a meet and greet uh, meeting with uh, families and patients. We don't charge them for that. And um, we'll, uh, we'll give them some ideas about the availability of some of these clinical trials that we're running through the Regenesis Project. And you can learn more about this. So we have patients from all over the world that come in. Um, uh, but in terms of getting it in your neck of the woods, um, this is something that's going to happen over the next six to 12 months. Um, if you're more interested in being a sub-investigator uh, and, and perhaps acquiring uh, this, this kind of um, device, um, there's a lot to setting it up. You need to have the advanced imaging. You need to have a navigation capability. Um, there's a lot of pieces to this. It's not a simple thing. I, I kind of presented it as a simple thing, uh, but it requires a lot of skills and a lot of equipment. And um, probably um, something, the total cost would be probably about $500,000 to get this set up as, uh, as, as a clinic um, uh, item. So um, I can say more about this if, if there's an individual, a, a doctor who wants to be a sub-investigator is interested in acquiring this somewhere around the world. We can talk to you about that. But I think for now, it's um, individuals uh, traveling to get the therapy and then going back to their uh, site of origination.